We're going to be continuing our journey, as you see, through the book of Philippians. So will you please take your Bibles and turn there to chapter 1. We're going to be looking specifically at verses 21 to 24. It's going to be the focus of our time together today. Philippians has many high points. Some of my favorite passages in the Bible are in this book. But perhaps none of them captures the theme of this particular book more than this section of Scripture that we're going to look at today. That's why this particular text, as you'll see in just a minute, is the basis uh, for the title of our entire series, Christ is Life. And so as a pastoral team, we've been eager to enjoy and share these truths with you together today. Philippians 1, beginning in verse 21. This is God's holy and inspired word speaking to us today. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word in our midst today. Well, as many of you are aware, March Madness is upon us. The NCAA tournament, exactly, yes, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of enthusiasm. The NCAA basketball tournament has started this past weekend. And uh, every year, tens of millions of us waste our time filling out a bracket. Completely wasted time. We sit down, we're trying to pick at least, just at least get half the Sweet 16 right. And it should be so easy on paper. It should be easy decisions, and yet we agonize over the choices. We, there's this internal dilemma. I don't know if you can relate to this. There's this internal dilemma that I always feel as I sit down to fill out my bracket. The first, the first side of me just says, make the safe picks, Bart. Just make the safe picks. Maybe that's enough. You just pick the higher team every time, and maybe that'll be enough to win your office pool to get you bragging rights with all the buddies. It's safer, but it's also kind of boring. And so then there's this other competing desire inside of me that wants to pick all the upsets, right? So when that magical Cinderella run happens that nobody saw coming, you can say, yeah, I had that in my bracket. I had that one. I picked it, saw it coming. There's this dilemma that, that's inside of us. Well, life Life is full of dilemmas. Two different things that we want. Two different things that we want at the same time. And the problem is that if you have one, they're mutually exclusive. If you have one, you don't have the other. And in those moments, competing desires can make our decisions harder. When we sit down and we think through this decision, it makes it harder. Some dilemmas, like tournament brackets, are just for fun. Other dilemmas have more serious consequences. As we'll see this morning, Paul is in the midst of a dilemma. He's sitting down, he's considering what's before him, and he's in the midst of a dilemma. As you can tell, we're continuing through an autobiographical section in this opening chapter. Paul is pouring out his heart to the Philippians. He is soon going to hear the verdict in his appeal. That's why he's in Rome, he's in prison. He's going to be exonerated and released from prison? Or is he going to be convicted, found guilty, and possibly face execution? But as he thinks about both of these options, and they're both very real for him, he feels a dilemma. He has two conflicting desires that, that rise up inside of him. They pull him in two different directions. But as we'll see, though, these two desires, they're coming from one single adoration. One consuming adoration. So that's our simple structure this morning to this text. One consuming adoration, two competing desires. So let's first consider Paul's one consuming adoration. It's in verse 21. The opening phrase there, for to me. You see that right in the beginning of verse 21. That opening phrase is emphatic. It's a, it's a, it's a statement that's controlling both of the options that come after it. You see the rest of the verse is a parallel structure to the verse. 
It contrasts these two options. And, and what's controlling both options is for to me. That, that's, that's what's leading both of those options. And notice that these options, they're kind of all-encompassing options. They encompass, <clears throat> they don't leave anything out. One is all of life in this world. And one is the, the life that is to come. What's next? But even as they are all-encompassing, there's something even greater. There's something that's underlying both of them. And underlying both of them is Paul's single, consuming adoration. In the original there, the words Christ and gain, in in verse 21, at the end of each option, those things, the original there, they're unmistakably, unmistakably linked. They're connected together. And so we see there that when when Paul wants to be clear, when I talk about gain, I'm talking about Jesus Christ. There's a connection there. That's what what he's referencing, and that's crucial to see because Jesus is both options. See that? Jesus is both options. Jesus has so captured, he's so captured Paul's heart. He's so captured his mind that it transforms, it's transforming in that moment how he thinks and how he feels about everything else. And that includes his own life and death. That's, that's what's consuming him. And so we, we tend to naturally view life and death as an end in of themselves. Like, that's, that's the purpose. But notice here that Paul, that's not how Paul views it anymore. Paul now cares about what each of those things means in light of Jesus Christ. What each of those, the value that each of those things has in light of the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. They are now a means for him. To live means something. To die means something for him. Jesus has become so glorious to Paul. He's, been so, he's become so comprehensive over everything that he's worth viewing all things, including the most important things in Paul's life, in reference to him. That's what, that's what he's seeing here. There's no greater purpose for the things that he's walking through in this life, and there's no greater hope for the next. Jesus is both of those. And so we remember Paul's eager expectation from the previous verse. We heard it last week. The previous verse, he says, that with full courage, this is his eager expectation, that with full courage, now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. That is what his eager expectation is. And so we ask the question, how did he get there? How did a guy like Saul of Tarsus, a guy who was breathing out murderous threats against the church, a guy who was consumed with himself, how did he get to that point? What compelled him there? What moved him there? Theologian F.F. Bruce, he describes Paul's motivation this way. Paul knew the love of Christ to be the all-compelling power in life. Where love is the compelling power, there is no sense of strain or conflict or bondage in in doing what is right. The man or woman who is compelled by Jesus' love and empowered by his Spirit does the will of God from the heart. That's what's moving him. That's what's compelling him. The love that Paul had found in Jesus Christ is what changed him. See, Christianity isn't first and foremost about what you do and you don't do. Christianity comes from having the transforming love, the transforming life of Jesus Christ shed abroad in our hearts. That's the basis of Christianity. We we don't want to make a mistake here. Jesus is glorious on his own just because of who he is. Whether or not we see it, he is that. But, but as sinners, as people like Saul of Tarsus, with hard hearts, that love ourselves, and love our own conveniences, and love our own comforts, love life being about me, what changes those kinds of hearts, hearts like mine, and compels us to honor him, whether by life or by death, is a glimpse of him on the cross. It's the gospel message. It's him hanging there taking our curse. That's what changes. That's what moves us. 
Listen, we don't have the power within us to adore Christ the way that Paul adores Christ. That's not something that we can put there. It has to, be, it has to come from outside of us, and it comes from the Spirit shining a light on the love and the message and the glory of the gospel in our hearts. And Calvary is the only thing that's strong enough to create a testimony like Paul's, to make this change in his life. And it's there at the cross that Paul found his life. Seeing his love for us, this is it, seeing his love for us is where we will find our life. Seeing his love for us in the gospel is where we will find our life. You could experience a thousand lifetimes. You could search the entire cosmos. If you had the ability to do that, to live a thousand lifetimes and to go wherever you wanted to go and to search out whatever you wanted to search out, if you had that ability, if we had that and the resources to do that, we would never find the life that we were looking for apart from that hill. We would never find it. There's a lot of things out there that, 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 sh- that promise those things, but we would never find it apart from that hill. Simply put, there is no life apart from Jesus Christ. There are only illusions and imposters. There's only illusions and imposters. Paul's heart and mind, they weren't distracted by those things. They weren't pulled away by those things. He had found his one consuming adoration, and it was in Jesus Christ. It was in the love that Jesus had displayed when he loved him and gave himself for him. Jesus alone, in Paul's eyes now, is worthy of referencing his own life and death. Jesus alone is actually his life. And as Paul grows in his adoration of Jesus Christ, we see that attention is beginning to develop in his soul. Or not just beginning, it's been there. Two competing desires surface in these next verses, and that's the second part of our structure this morning. It's the second part of the structure. Two competing desires. In verses 22 to 24, Paul's fleshing out the two desires that, that he introduces in verse 21. On the one side, he says, for me to go on living as Christ. That's one of his desires. But on the other side, he says, as I think about the future, as I contemplate the future, a very real desire for me is to depart and be with Christ. To die is gain. That's, that's another desire in his heart. And notice that both of these desires are good desires. Both of them are coming out of his love and his affection and his, and his commitment to Jesus Christ. Both of them are legitimate. We can't read natural feelings into this here. These, these are not like the desires of the world that he's expressing. Paul doesn't want to stay alive because he's afraid of dying. No, he desires to stay in the flesh for the sake of fruitful labor. You see that there at the beginning of verse 22. You see that? If I'm to live in the flesh, if I'm to live in the flesh, go on living, wake up another day, that means when I wake up that day, you know what comes to my mind? That means fruitful labor for me. That means fruitful labor for me. Nor does he desire death primarily as a way to escape the burdens and the hurt of this life, the pain of this world. Certainly, Paul carried many of those things. I mean, he he had scars. He had emotional scars. He had physical scars on his body from the burdens that he'd carried in this life. But as we'll see, it isn't the bitterness of this life that he's mostly focused on when he says these things. It's the sweetness of the next. That's where his aim is. He talks about it in terms of gain. And so we see these are good desires. One is pushing him towards the need that he sees here, and the other, the other is steering him towards the Savior that he longs to be with. They're good desires. But both are also strong desires. Look at the end of verse 22. He says, Yet, which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. Immediately, we can feel the weight that both carry for him, that, that both mean to him. These are not passing whims. These are deep desires. There's a, there's a battle raging inside of him. There's a genuine, he's genuinely torn between the two. He says, I know what I would prefer on my, on, for my benefit, but I also know what I would prefer for your benefit. And even as he's talking through them, even as we see in this verse, he's talking through them, He's he's clearly been thinking about this for a long time, but even as he's expressing these desires, he really can't answer. 
I don't know, I still don't know what I would answer for myself. If you sat me down and said, which one, right now, tell me. He says, I, I, I don't know. I still don't know how to choose. The thought of leaving them in need is so painful for him. But the thought of departing and being with Christ is so wonderful to him. You can almost imagine like two towering walls, just sheer cliffs in this narrow canyon passage. They're, they're hemming him in from both sides. They're, they're, they're forcing him down this road together. They're, for Paul, there's not like a third option where I can just have my cake and eat it too. There's these two things. The, the, this is, these are the two things that are compelling and, and pushing me forward. Both are pressing in on me. He feels, he, he, says, he says, I am hard pressed. Literally, I, I, feel the, I feel the pressure of both. What a wonderful wrestling that's going on in this man's soul. What a wonderful internal struggle. He's not being conflicted and consumed by lesser things. The worth of Jesus Christ has elevated this tension in his soul. It's the worth of Jesus Christ that has elevated these desires in his soul. These are strong desires. They're strong for him. And we see why they're so strong. We see why they're so strong. One of them is far, far better. And one of them is more necessary. We see both of those options there. At the end of verse 23, he talks about the far better option. He says this, my desire, my desire, if, you, if, if it was just me without reference to anybody else, me on my own, my desire is to depart. My desire is to be with Christ. That's what Paul would pick for himself. The verb depart there carries this idea of weighing anchor, setting sail, pulling up the camp. It's time to go. Let's go on the march. That's what I would pick for myself. That's what Paul's saying conveys this idea of, of a continuance. There's a seamlessness. And not only that, but, but while it's seamless, at the same time, there's still a, a change that's happening. There's a change that this entails. Notice that he isn't describing a desire like many of the Greeks of his day would have understood it to be. He's describing a ceasing of this life, but he isn't describing a ceasing of life. Instead, Departing means something else. Departing this life means something else. It means this. It means being with Christ. There isn't a step in between. There's departing this world. You notice that? To depart and to be with Christ. There's departing this world, and there's being with Christ. And for the Christian, stepping off of this planet isn't falling out into nothingness. Is stepping into his presence. Stepping out of this world is stepping into his presence. Those two things, they're simultaneous. They go together. Paul holds them together. And the instant transition that Paul will face as he goes through that is going to usher him, and he, he knows it's going to usher him into something that is far better. In fact, he uses two different comparatives here to, to try to convey that. He, 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 wants to, he wants them to see just how much better being there is. How much better the future will be. It is indeed, this is almost the way he's saying it, it is indeed much better by far. Like if I, if I could just keep piling those on, I would. It is much better by far. Like I can't even begin to describe to you how much better it is. And note again what it is that is making that option so much better. We've already seen him describing death in terms of gain, and specifically that that gain is Jesus Christ. Paul isn't so much interested in gaining heaven on its own, per se, as he is really interested in being with Jesus Christ. That's what's driving his desire. Being with Christ is what he desires most for himself. That's what he most wants for himself. It's like him saying, imagine the most beautiful place on the earth, with your favorite person on the best day ever. Imagine that scene, being there, as great as that scene is, as, as, much of a, as much of a bucket list as that thing is. Imagine that day. Picture that day. And on that day, even that day, can't touch what it's going to be like to be with Christ. 
Paul is claiming that even during the best moments here, I'd still rather be with Jesus. I would rather fully experience Jesus Christ, finally free from sin and weakness. I would rather be able to see him as he is, face to face, than to see all the beauty of this world together. With Christ is the best possible existence that anyone can have. It is the best possible existence that anyone can have. Paul doesn't want to cease to exist, to escape the burdens. He doesn't want paradise on its own for its own sake. Charles Spurgeon captures his heart this way. Oh, to think of heaven without Christ. It is the same as thinking of hell. Heaven without Christ, it is day without the sun. Existing without life. Feasting without food. Seeing without light. It involves a contradiction in terms. Heaven without Christ, absurd. It is the sea without water. The earth without its fields. The heavens without their stars. There cannot be heaven without Christ. He is the sum total of bliss. He is the fountain from which heaven flows. He is the element of which heaven is composed. Christ is heaven, and heaven is Christ. Or as Asaph puts it in Psalm 73, Whom have I in heaven but you? In earth, there's nothing here that I desire besides you. If he is our life, if he is our life, then being where he is is where we most and ultimately want to be. Jesus, Jesus is the difference between a Christian's view of the afterlife and every other alternate ending. Being with Jesus is the difference. That's the difference. There's categories for paradise and there's categories, and again, None of those things are necessarily wrong, but Jesus is the difference. Being with him. But we see that this desire for Paul, it's not unhealthy selfishness on his part. As we'll see, there's another conflicting. It's another strong desire. It's another one of these canyon walls that's hemming him in. It's a conflicting desire that's present within him. Because he doesn't consider his life only in reference to himself. He considers himself and the life that he has here in reference to other people. That's, that's why he has this other desire. He, you see that? He's not, a sol- he's not just thinking about his own, what, what he wants most. He genuinely has a desire to think about his life with reference to other people. That's the way he thinks about himself. And so this is the, this is the option that is more necessary. Look in verse 24. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary, look at this, on your account, in reference to the Philippians. There's this strong, other-centered desire that's at work within his heart as well. That's what causes him to want to stay in this life. His reference to other people is what causes him to want to stay in this life. And we we want to trace the the, the progression of this option, of staying here, to help us understand this desire. We want to trace trace it with me. In verse 21... He describes this as to live as Christ. But then he goes on and he says, if I, am to, if I am to continue in the flesh, that means fruitful labor. That's in verse 22. And then we continue on. He says, but to remain in the flesh, in verse 24, to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. So we've got to see the logical flow here. We want to trace that. Paul's saying, in other words, to go on living, to keep waking up every day in this world, for me, means to, to live for Christ. And what it means to live for Christ, for me, is fruitful labor. And fruitful labor is more necessary on your account. That's the, that's the flow there. That's his thinking. So even while he has a desire to depart and to be with Christ, his concern for other people, and in particular his concern and his desire for the church, is so strong that it won't allow him to be idle in this world. It doesn't allow him to be idle in this world. There's fruitful labor being released from prison doesn't equate to easy street for Paul. It's not what he's looking forward to. And listen, if anybody could say, I've done enough, that's enough, it would have been him, right? 
I mean, if you were in his shoes, wouldn't you be tempted to think that way? Wouldn't you be tempted to think that? Look at all the sacrifices that I've made for all the years. Look at the journeys I've been on. Look at the, look at the church plants and the accomplishments that, I, that I've done. Think about all the sacrifices that I've made. Think about all the suffering that I've gone through. Listen, if I get out of this one, this is the way I would think. If I get out of this one, I'm out. I'm out. I'm not even here justly. I'm here because I was wrongfully accused. And so if I get out of this one, that's it. Let somebody else pick up this one. Let somebody else get the tab the next round. That, that's what I would, it'd be easy for me to think that way. But notice, Paul, he's not keeping a tally. He's not sitting in prison recounting all that. He's not keeping a tally. He doesn't have his eyes on past accomplishments. His step may have slowed. But the urgency of the mission that he sees before him hasn't. His eyes may have grown a little more dim. But his passion for the gospel, his passion to see churches planted and built and to serve, that, that had, that's burning brighter than ever. It's burning brighter than ever, even as he thinks about these things. There are more seeds to plant. There are more churches to be strengthened. There are, there are more poor to be cared for. There's more study of the scriptures that's needed. There's more discipleship of the next generation that we want to see. There is still, if Paul could see, he could see the need. He saw the harvest. He saw it white. He saw the need that was out there. And he thought of himself in reference to that. And he thought about this, the, the, the hourglass and the sand that he could see slipping out. That's how he thought. That's how he thought of those things. And through this, we can feel the affection that he has for this local church. Look, 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 he wants, he longs for the time that he has left to be of some benefit to them. That's what he wants to stay here for. And he's even willing to delay his very strong preference for, in order to see them. If it, he's willing to delay that and give that up if it means that they're going to grow in maturity and grow in unity. That's what he wants. He knows their warts. He's fully aware of the problems and the things that they're fumbling with. This isn't him, you know, pie in the sky. He's fully aware of these things. But time, distance, suffering, even their own messiness, none of those have dampened his desire to remain on their account. None of that's dampened it. Now, certainly, Paul is unique in a lot of ways. We want to recognize that. None of us is called to serve as the apostle to the Gentiles. We aren't intended to try to replicate his life. That was a specific calling for a specific man in a specific era. Nor is this suggesting that we should be frantically rushing from one thing to the next without ever stopping to enjoy anything in life. It's not saying that. But Paul never lost sight of the precious commodity that is time. He was always investing the hours that God gave him in the roles that God had placed him in for the sake of the people that God has put in his life. That's how he saw time. He was always investing the hours that God gave him in the roles that God had placed him in for the sake of the people that God had brought into his life. And he was going to man that post. He was going to stay at his station as long as he had breath in his lungs. That was his goal. And it was a high and it was a happy motivation for him. It led him to an active others-centered view of his time. An active others-centered view. To go on living, he says, is more necessary on your account. That's how he thought about his time. That's why he wanted to stay. That's why he wanted another day. It's another day that can be used, it's necessary, it can be used for your benefit. Another day in reference to somebody else that I can serve. Another part of the role that God has given me. Another opportunity to benefit. That's why he wanted to stay. So these are the two competing desires that are in his heart. This, this for Paul is the life-defining dilemma. He carried it with him until the day that he died. But it's not one that he carries anymore. He is far better off now. This man who talked about this actually is today 
far better off. But his struggle has been preserved. His internal battle has been preserved. It's been preserved specifically for us to benefit from. As we'll see in a a few weeks, Paul already has a pretty good idea of which direction this trial is trending. He, He, in fact, he probably knows the most likely, he's probably known the most likely outcome for a while. Probably long before he ever wrote this section of Scripture. So we have to ask the question, why? Why, why, if you know the outcome, then why are you wrestling through this? And why go through all the trouble of, of sharing these things with somebody else? Why would you put that in a letter? Well, Paul is so filled with the Spirit that, that really he can't help him to share his heart with other people. He can't help but talk about how wonderful Jesus is. And he can't help but express his care and concern for this church. But there's something else this is intended to do. It's intended to move us, to move our lives towards the same tension, towards the same God-oriented wrestling in our hearts. So before we close this morning, let's, let's consider a simple question together. The question is this. Does this tension actually exist in your heart? Does it actually exist in your heart? Is Jesus so wonderful to you that you feel both of these desires pulling on you? Given times, you feel these desires actually pulling on you. They're trying to steer you in one direction or the other. Listen, as we grow in our knowledge and our love for Jesus, both of these longings should begin to emerge. We're supposed to live a a, a godly life has this dilemma in it. It has this tension in it. A dilemma should be present in our lives. If it isn't, we're heading for problems. We're heading for problems because there's a danger of getting pulled off center too far to one side or the other. There's a problem with having one, grasping a hold of one at the expense of the other. On one side, we don't want our lives to be so busy serving that we end up losing the one thing that moved us to start with, namely the love of God that we've found through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't want to be so busy there that we lose the motivation and the consuming adoration that we had at the beginning. We may start off with good intentions, but over time, and as we meet frustrations, and we will, and we do meet frustrations, things that we didn't see coming, those things begin to take a toll, and a weariness can start to creep into this task. Mentally, we begin to keep score counting all the ways and all the times that we have served. It's how we start to view our lives. Suddenly, possibly without even noticing, and we start to, we continue to serve the church, but we're doing these things more so out of duty or to save face. We do them with no reference, no reference to the good news of Jesus Christ. There's, There's no love that we're finding in our souls for Jesus. That passion that we had for him has slowly cooled. Even while we're busy, the desire to be with Christ, the longing for his return, the things that are supposed to mark the church in every season, those things begin to wane. Those things begin to be eroded. Listen, that place, that place, while outside it looks okay, it's a dangerous place to be. It's dangerous for our souls, and ultimately, it's deadly for our mission as a church deadly for us. We must be continually cultivating a hunger, a hunger, a desire to be with Christ, a hunger for God's presence. If we never are experiencing that here, how will we long to be with him there? If we never experience it here, how are we going to long to be with him there? And, and how can we testify with Paul? How can we stand alongside Paul and say, my desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. How can we give that testimony if it's someone that we don't really know that well? And we know very little about. This sounds like an area that's, that's lagging in your heart. That, that you're thinking, man, that, that describes a lot of what I feel. I want to suggest two things. There's a lot of different things that we can do. But I want to suggest two things that can help promote this desire inside of us. First, I would recommend picking up a biography. Pick up a biography. Read the story of somebody whose life was marked 
by a passion for Jesus Christ. There's a lot of great biographies out there, and those things can have a profound impact in our hearts. I recently read a biography like that. I was struck by a poem, and it was written about a saint who was facing his own death. He was eagerly awaiting his time to depart and to be with Christ. And the words, they just stirred my soul towards that. They moved me towards that. And here's, here's what he wrote. A ray hath broken from Canaan's land, across that sullen flood. It bids him quit its mortal strand and onward march to God. Oh, could we catch one moment's view of what he must now know. Sorrow would fill our spirits too, to linger thus below. Biographies. Christ-loving saints can motivate us. They can move us towards this life-defining tension. They can help ignite that in our hearts. And also as a second help towards this area, I would suggest that this be the focus, this specific thing be the focus of your fast in a few weeks. We we have a wonderful opportunity in a few weeks, the first week fast of April. Use this as as a desire and a request. It's It's a great chance to increase our anticipation of what it means to be with Jesus be with him in his presence, sitting within his presence here on this earth, but ultimately being with him fully in heaven. Certainly the Spirit of God is the only one who can produce this in our lives, but we want to be anticipating him moving in our lives. He's an active spirit. We want to trust him enough to use the means that he has graciously given us towards the end, towards that end. We have means that are at our fingertips. And these, really, these are two wonderful. There's, there's many others. There's many others. But these are two wonderful means to be able to do that. So take advantage of those things. But even as we cultivate this, as we cultivate a desire to be with Christ, we have to be careful we avoid the danger on the other side. This is not a new danger, but it's again prominent in our day. That's a desire to want all the blessings of Christ's presence. But with no concern for the church, and no commitment to see the gospel extend. We, we want to, and I, I can see this in my own heart, we want to sit at the table, but we really don't want to go out in the fields. Eating at the table is good, working in the fields, that's sweaty. And if we're leaning this way, the phrases that Paul is using to define his life, things like fruitful labor for me, and more necessary on your account, those things start to sound odd to us. We don't feel the urgency that Paul felt when he said these things. And I want to speak to two specific groups here where that can easily play itself out. In my generation, and certainly in the generation after mine, Christianity has come to be defined in terms of my experience alone. It's defined in terms of my experience alone. What do I get out of it? Now, experience on its own is is, is a good thing. Genuine spiritual experience, that's a great thing. But it can't be alone. It can't be at the expense of something else. We can't say, give me all the goosebumps that I can have while we're at worship. Give me as much knowledge as I can get from the sermon podcast and from the latest book that's been printed. But dealing with other Christians, no thanks. No thanks. That's for somebody else. That's for other Christians. Somebody else has that calling. I'm going to opt out of that one. I'm not going to click on that one. Listen, those people... Those people make messes. Those people, they're hypocritical. And even worse, they're draining. Just feels a lot safer. Just me and Jesus. Me and Jesus. That feels a lot safer. And if I'm going to let anybody in, it's going to be a small circle and it's going to be on my terms. That's, that's how we're reviewing. In other words, what is more necessary on my account? What is more necessary on my account? But listen, if it's an adoration for Christ... If it's an adoration for Christ and not just some feeling that we're after, that's, if that's what's consuming our hearts, an adoration for Jesus, then by necessity, it will begin to compel us out, to push us out. Adoration for Christ is going to move us towards folks in our small group who aren't exactly like us. Adoration for Christ is going to move us towards that neighbor who always wants to talk when we're pulling in the garbage cans. Adoration for Christ is going to move us towards children's ministry because we see the need and we see the opportunity to serve the next generation with the Word of God, even though it means Saturday night that I'm having to prepare. 
Adoration for Christ is going to move us towards the places on the earth who have never heard the gospel. Who don't know who this Jesus is. Those are the places that this moved Paul. And those are the places that this has to move us. It has to move us in that direction. And so if you're, if you're young and you're aware of this trend, don't buy into that. This whole me and, just me and Jesus, nobody else. No reference to anyone else. Don't buy into that. That's an unbalanced view of the Christian life. And for those who are later in life, the same, the same temptation really can be present, although it may look very different. How easy is it to believe these whispers in the back of your mind that because of age, your contributions aren't needed anymore? Paul is later in his life when he says, to remain is necessary. The church needed him. Churches everywhere still have a desperate need for those among us who have walked with the Lord through many different stages in life, who've been through the things that the, us who are younger are facing now, that we're looking to. We need those folks. Contributions that you make late in life may be some of the most important contributions and the most lasting things that you ever do in this life. Or maybe as you approach, you pass retirement age, it starts to feel like you've done enough. And that could be partly true. I don't want to deny that. Maybe you have served, you've run your race in specific roles. No longer your parents are grown, your, your, your kids are grown and out. You're no longer in that same day-to-day -day parenting mode. Maybe how you've served the Lord through your career is over. You're able to retire. Maybe those things have run their course. But even if the roles are looking different, the end of your life is still meant to count for the need that is present in this world and in the church. The end of your life is still meant to count for those things. Fruitful labor instead of coasting to the finish line is what should mark these years. Again, it isn't wrong to enjoy things. I'm not saying that. It's not wrong to go out and enjoy vacation. You've earned it in a lot of ways. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is don't sub yourself out of the game. Don't take yourself and put it on the sidelines. What impact, what impact does God intend to make through you now that you have a freer schedule? God intends for that time. If you're gonna, he, he wants you to continue on in this life. What impact is he intending for you to have? Because there's one that he wants you to have. Invest that time. Whether we're young, or whether we're in the late stages of life, to go on living is Christ. Age doesn't change that. The roles may change, but that doesn't change. And so this tension, this tension is supposed to be present in our souls. It's supposed to be present in our hearts. This is the dilemma. This is the dilemma that we're supposed to be facing. And this passage this morning, this particular passage in Philippians, it's meant to do that. It's meant to increase that in our hearts. It's meant to increase that in our lives. So as we close this morning, we're going to walk out the doors, we're going to go to lunch. And our thoughts are going to turn, our thoughts are going to turn to the week that lies ahead. Whatever it is, there's, whatever, whatever that thing is that's coming, and, and most of you already have it in your mind. Probably already been there while I was preaching this morning. It's okay. Whatever that thing is, may the words of Paul May the words of Paul, as it comes to mind, may the words of Paul just begin to echo. To echo into your hearts. To echo into your minds. For to me, for to me, to live, to live as Christ, and to die, to die is gain. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, what a wonderful, wonderful privilege to see this tension in Paul. Lord, thank you for a life 
that was consumed with the value and the worth and the glory of Jesus Christ. Lord, I, I know in my own life, I just see areas where I want to grow in these things. I want to, I want to avoid both of these dangers. I want both of these tensions to be in my heart. Lord, I, I pray that for each and every one of us. There's a specific area, Lord, where, where maybe we're getting off center. Maybe, maybe we are. We are serving so much, but Lord, our desire and our passion to be with you, our longing to be with you has waned. Lord, I pray that by the power of your Spirit this morning and through your Word, Lord, that you would rekindle that in our hearts. You would rekindle that in our minds, Lord. Maybe there's areas, Lord, that we feel like we've done enough. That's it. Uh, it, uh, it, it is hard out there. Lord, I pray that this text would remind us of the need, would allow us to see with fresh eyes and with fresh vision and with fresh purpose that you've put us here for a reason. Lord, we long for our lives to bring you glory in all that we say, in all that we do. Lord, point out the areas where, where that's not happening and bring yourself glory in this church and bring yourself glory throughout all generations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.